Amen. Amen. Well, if you only had a, a few days to live here on earth and you began to pray, what would you be praying about? You only had a couple of days here, you knew it. What would your prayer sound like? Many in here, we'd be praying for probably family. Anybody? Raise your hand. You'd be praying for family that you'd be leaving behind, some friends, maybe confessing some sin that you're like, man, I need to get that out. Jesus, please forgive me. There's a variety of different things that we would be praying. What's really cool about uh, this reading plan is you, especially in John 17, this section that we read, we got insight into the last prayer that Jesus was talking to the Father all through John 17. It's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the entire text. And it's almost like we're eavesdropping on Jesus and what's really important, like, man, here's some high priority things. Before he goes to the cross, he spends this time with God the Father and, and we get to see this insight. And I don't know if you caught it, there's a couple themes in the prayer that I wanted to point it out and just remind us of what we read. Number one, if you see it, he constantly talks about oneness, about unity. Did you notice that? It's like he constantly goes back to, man, I just pray that, that my people, my disciples will be one, just like you and I are one. And the 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 connection he makes about the power of unity, it's not just unity for unity's sake. It's that the disciples would be on the same page so the people outside of this, this church, they would be able to look and go, man, that's something different right there. Those people love each other. They're on the same page. They might not agree on everything, but there's a, there's a unity about them. That's a major part of the heart of Jesus. And then the second theme that I, I noticed in this is what I will, it's really the title of the message. He talks about his, his disciples being in the world, but not of it. In the world, not of it. And what I was thinking about is such a tension for a lot of us Christians, because some of us Christians in here, if we're really honest, we're like, dude, I'm done with all this world. I'm gonna get in my little Christian bubble, sing Kumbaya, and never make a difference at all in my world. And anything that is, you know, worldly at all. I'm just like, I'm out of here. I'm just gonna stay in my little Christian bubble, read my Bible, talk to my small group, and never have an effect in the world. Then we have other people that are like exact opposite. They're like, hey, I'm a Christian, but I'm gonna be, hey! I'm like all immersed in the world, and I don't even smell different at all. I just smell exactly like the world. And I believe one of the major themes in this prayer that Jesus is praying for his disciples, and he's praying for you and I, it's like, hey, man, neither. He's like, I want you to be in the world, but don't smell of it. Make an effect, make an impact. What, last time I checked, Jesus said, go and make disciples. He, what did Jesus, Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost. So he's, in essence, called us to mission. And I wanna show this to you. We're gonna kind of break it down. Let's start in John chapter Chapter 17, verse 11. Look at verse 11, and you'll get an insight into his heart as he's praying to God the Father. He says, now I'm departing from the world. They are staying, my disciples, they're staying in this world, but I'm coming to you. Holy Father, you've given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united. Underline that, there it is, united just as we are, it's this connection, this oneness, this unity. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. Anybody love God's protection? It's, it's powerful. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. You remember Judas Iscariot and, and kissing Jesus on the cheek, betraying him, that's what he's talking about here. Verse 13 and if you're a note taker, you can jot it down. We're gonna go in reverse order. Let's start with not of it. Look at verse 13. Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with what? With my joy. We say it all the time. No Eeyore Christians, man. 
What your, your coworker and your neighbor need to see is genuine joy in the midst of a painful world. That is what changes lives. Verse 14, I've given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong, there it is, they're not of it, do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Verse 14 in the New King James Version, I wanna read it for you, it was really good. I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are, and I, and I underline this in my, not of the world. When you look at the, the word for world in the Greek, it's actually cosmos. And one of the definitions of it is an arranged order. So what Jesus is, is starting out, he's saying, guys, I'm not of this world. It's a different arranged order. It's a different system. I'm the king of a different kingdom. It's not this temporary world system that, that you're, you're living in right now. It's a completely different system. In 1 Chronicles 29, 15, it says, we are here only for a moment. Everybody just snap your fingers. That's your life right there. We're only here for a moment. In the, in the, in the concept of, of eternity, here we are. It's a snap of a finger. We're only here for a moment. We're visitors and strangers. We're aliens in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon without a trace. I was thinking about this. We're, we're from a different world, and we're here temporarily. Um, I started thinking of camping. Any, any camping folks in here? Raise your hand. You're, you like camping? Like, you guys are crazy. I don't understand you guys. Like, I went camping one time. True story. I went camping one time. I lasted till like two in the morning. I was like, what am I doing here? I have, I have a roof over my house. I don't have to be here. I couldn't sleep. I, I was hungry. My back hurt. I'm like on this dirt. I'm like, what am I doing here? And I went straight, I mean, straight back home and got a good night's sleep. And while some of you guys are up all night, like, what do you, um, but then I, <laughs> that's, that's a picture of us. Like we're, we're here camping, man, for a little while. This is not our land. We, we're from a, a different land. Camping, it's temporary. And I was thinking about another picture of this. Um, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, and he actually said that we're Christ's ambassadors. And that gave me a little bit better picture. We're from a different world. We're, we're representing heaven to, to people in this world in a different um, system of, of the way the world works. We're from a different kingdom and God sent us here to be a picture of heaven for those that have yet to be introduced to God. And I, I just love it. In, in 2 Corinthians 5, I'll just read it for you. I didn't give it to the team. I apologize. Jot it down. Go study it later. It's fantastic scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us so what does that mean? If you're a Christian in here today, when you show up to work tomorrow, your neighborhood, your sports team, your school, if you claim to be a Christian, the non-believing world's looking at you and going, oh, that's what Jesus looks like. It's a very sobering thought. If you're an ambassador for Christ, we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And I always think about this this way. It's like, okay, if God's spirit living through me and and I'm in a world where people are looking at my life and I'm saying, just come back to God. And they're like, man, and love's coming out? They're gonna be attracted to that. But if I'm like, like beating people over the head with my Bible, like condemning them, saying, dude, you better get in line like how awesome I am, you idiot. Like, is that burning a bridge or building a bridge? And so, so we're ambassadors, man. We're, we're from heaven. God sent us to represent Christ in this powerful way. I was... I looked up the word for ambassador. Check this out. It says, an accredited, accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. <laughs> we are in a foreign land, man. And it's tragic, and the Bible actually says that Satan is the God of this world. He has set up the system, and now we're in it. The question is, are we gonna be in it, not of it? Jesus says this a chapter later in John 18, 36, he says, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. 
If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. Remember when Peter did? He tried to whack off that that dude's ear, like probably he's trying to cut off his head, cut off his ear instead. And Jesus dips down and he grabs the homie's ear, like puts it back on. He's like, bro, he's pumped the brakes here, Pete. This is not how we're doing this. That's really what he's saying. It's a different kingdom. My kingdom, and this is what he says, is not of this world. It's a completely different way of thinking. It's a different frame of reference. They used to have this old clothing line, N-O-T-W, not of this world. And they would, remember that? Where my old Christians at? Y'all remember that one? That's extinct. But man, that's the idea. It's like, hey, we're gonna make effect. We're gonna be in the world, but we're gonna smell a little bit different. It's attractive. And people are like, dude, there's something different there. What is that? In John's little letter, 1 John 2, verse 15, he says, do not love this world. It's that same Greek word, cosmos. Do not love this world, the system, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. And man, that was challenging to me. And he's not saying don't love the world like people that are disconnected from God. Absolutely, we're, called, we're supposed to love the world in the sense of the people. But the system, he's like, don't fall in love with the system, man. That's the system of the enemy. And I was thinking just how personally, how I got sucked up into this. And I'll just share a little bit from my heart, if, I, if you don't mind. I was sharing this at our small group. By the way, who, who in here is part of a small group? Raise your hand, by the way. This is the heart of the church. The church should never get bigger than four to 14. And we were talking about this concept of being squeezed into the pattern of the world and not even knowing it. And as I grew up, this is how it happened for me. This is Again, I got my own free will choice, but I bought the lie. And the way it started was actually a deep lie of rejection. Went through, my parents went through a divorce when I was young, and I felt rejected. I felt abandoned. No shame, no blame. I love, I've forgiven my parents. We love each other. We've reconciled. It's all good. But the reality was it created something in me of an insecurity and a rejection. In seventh grade, I tried out for a, a traveling basketball team and thought I was making it. And then the coach came up to me after. He's like, hey, you had a great, you had a great tryout, but Todd, you're too small for our team. What did that do? It developed that insecurity even deeper, the rejection issue deeper, the lie. And then, and then the last one I can, t- and there's several of these, but the ones I can remember my freshman year, I thought I was with a girl that I was gonna marry and you remember that? Were y'all freshmen? Yeah, I'm gonna marry that one. Yeah, actually, my one of my sons did marry a girl. <laughs> All right, so never mind. I can't say that. But for me, it didn't work out. And I remember she came and just dumped me, cold hearted. Just gave me the boot. <laughs> Sorry, bro. I'm gonna go date this other guy. And what did it do? It doubled down on the rejection. So I started buying into this insecurity and this this lie of if I can use that as fuel, I'm gonna prove someone wrong. And I will be accepted one day. I will make it. And, and here's what I bought into the lie. And I don't know if you've done this. You buy into the lie of accomplishment and accumulation. And so now, but if I make it athletically, if I make a name for myself, they're all gonna regret that they didn't see it earlier. And so now this unhealthy motivation actually motivated me. And now you get to this place, but then you get there and you're like, man, I still, I'm still empty. I'm still insecure. And and I didn't know it, but I was, I was wrapped into a world system that's led by Satan for me to believe that I'm going to be someone by accumulation or accomplishment. When in reality, what this is all about with this faith journey is with Jesus is really all about relationship and stewardship. And let's go back into this prayer. The prayer was that you'd be one like he and his father are one. So when we have deep relationship with God, we're good. When we steward the gifts we've been given, nothing wrong with things, but man, if the things got me, then I'm off. So now this whole, this whole world system He says, man, I I want you to be in it, but not of it. I don't want you to be tainted by the world system. And if I'm really honest with you, some of us as believers, we take the world system and then we put it into the church. 
we take the world system, we put it in our own life. And now here's how it kind of it, it happens. Man, did you, did you see how many, how many Bibles I gave away? If you can look on the, on the celebration, if, if we're not careful, we can brag about accomplishment if we don't have the right motivation where it's, no, man, we don't want to make disciples. It's not about love church. Or you got notches in your belt. Hey, did, you, did I tell you about the guy I led to Christ last week, man? It's awesome. And now we're bringing the world system and we're bringing it into Christianity. He says, no, 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 like be in the world, but not of it. Number two, you can write it down. It, now we're gonna talk about in it. Look at verse 15. John 17, 15. Now, I'm not asking you, this is so big, check this out. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Please underline that. If you have a tendency to get just stuck in your Christian bubble, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. And man, I just wanna say a big, um, I'm proud of you parents that are investing in your kids one day at a time in the Orange Bible. You know what you're doing? You are investing in them. You're giving them his word. I love that. It's truth. Look at 18. Just as you sent, everybody say sent. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. I'm not, I'm not keeping them in this little bubble. I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Now, now pause here because, man, this is where the tension lies. And I really, I mean, I remember early on in my, my faith journey after I came to Christ and about a year after I was down in Miami and I really wanted, I was, I was in a locker room for the Miami Dolphins and I really wanted to make a difference in the locker room. I was a newer Christian and I wanted to be light. I, I wanted to be in the locker room, but not of it. And if you're in a, most locker rooms, they're not real pretty, okay? I'll just, just put it at that, language and chaos and whatnot and but I wanted to make a difference. And so there were times where after games, we'd go out to dinner or they'd want to go out to a club. And I remember, I mean, they would literally go to a strip club and I'd be like, I'm the Christian, what do I do? And I remember I'd go to the, I'd go to the club and I'd stand out and talk to the bouncer of the strip club about Jesus. <laughs> and so like, okay, cool, I'm on mission but man, I'm kind of getting a little dangerous territory. And I remember never going into that, but I remember being in other places in Miami and I'm, drink, I'm not drinking alcohol, I'm drinking water, but I just started feeling myself gravitate back to my old ways in thought, not in deed, in thought. And I'm like, okay, that's getting a little dangerous right there. I might not need a season of just protecting myself from my past. So I, abs so I actually did have a season of the Christian bubble where I'm like, I, I'm just not strong enough to do that. And I remember talking to one of my mentors and I told him, I said, man, I wanna make a difference. What do I do? And he told, he told me, he gave me great advice if this is where you're at right now. He said, meet your friends, meet your teammates on neutral ground. So they're not necessarily going to church with you, but you're not necessarily going to the bar with them. You're meeting at a neutral spot. Go have a burger, shoot some hoops. And so I changed my perspective in that season where I was still in it, but I wasn't of it, that it was gonna compromise my faith. And so someone's excited about that. Maybe that helped you, and I appreciate that. But that's the idea. The idea is like, okay, what does this look like? And he says, man, I'm not telling you to stick in this bubble, but I'm telling you to, to be sent. What does that look like? As I was studying this, I was thinking about... Um, a couple of my friends, and they reminded me of Bible characters. And one, <laughs> one Bible character is a guy named Joseph. You guys remember studying Joseph? Joseph was this young guy, went through all this trial, this chaos, and before you know it, he's second in command of all of Egypt. And yet, he didn't compromise his faith. He worshiped God, but he went into the world. Next thing you know, he's got power and now he's using that power for, for, to honor God. And I was thinking of one of my friends who's, he's running for a political office on a school board, 
And the reason is, is A, he feels called to it, and B, he feels called to go into the world and be a difference maker for the glory of God. And I'm like, dude, that's what I'm talking about. That's like Joseph right there. And, and the influence, the biblical influence of love and grace, but truth and bringing that for our children in our culture, man. I'm like, dude, that dude is on mission. And another guy, I, I was thinking about one of my friends who, um, he's, on, he's a social media just gangster. And he's, I, I don't know how to explain it, but he felt this call to make a difference and to go, not shy away from social media or the internet, but to go into a gnarly place and to, and to use it for God's glory. And I started thinking of Daniel. Remember Daniel, man? Like, Daniel, like, that dude didn't compromise his faith a bit. And in the middle of Babylonian culture that was gnarly, he went right into it for the glory of God and God protected him. In fact, the Bible says that he was, he was leaning into his faith and they put him in a fire to, to, to singe the dude, to kill him because of his faith. And now he, they throw him in there. And, and God protected him in the fire. In fact, the Bible says even when they, he walked out, and King Nebuchadnezzar's like, bro, how'd that happen? And it actually says that he didn't even smell like smoke. And I started thinking, boy, that's what Jesus is talking about. You're in the world, but you don't smell like it. Because sometimes we got a group of Christians in here that are never going to make a difference. They're completely out of the world. Jesus said, I didn't say that. I said, man, get in the world. So one place, and you might be Christian bubble for a season, but man, don't stay there because there's a world that we need to go meet. But then there's some Christians that are over here, hey, hey, and we look exactly like the world. We smell like the world. And you're wondering why you're not making a difference. He says, be in the world not of it. So I was thinking about, I'm trying to give some practical handles. Let me give you another one. And again, this is, this is just, I'm just trying to help from a practical perspective so we can walk in the heart of Jesus as he's praying to the Father. And recently, here in America, we celebrated a holiday called Halloween. Now, let's just take this holiday and say it's an evil holiday, it's warped, and it's gnarly, but it could be the greatest <laughs> opportunity for a Christian because a bunch of kids are coming to your house <laughs> on mission for candy. So <laughs> we have choices. And again, everybody's got their own conviction, and you know, some Christians, you're like, dude, that's stumbling to me, I'm gonna shut my door, turn off my lights, I'm not gonna participate. And amen, like everybody's got their own free will choice and conviction, go with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But to me, I'm like, Lord, how do I steward this for your glory? How can I be in the world, not of it? I'm not gonna celebrate evil, but man, if they're coming to my door, let's do something. So I'm just gonna tell you practically what I did, you take it or leave it. We just moved to this new neighborhood a handful of months ago. I'm like, dude, I could get to meet some of the neighbors or some of the kids. So my wife went and got like really good candy. By the way, don't give the Chauncey candy, dude. Like, let's, 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 do, let's be generous. So she got good candy. And then I asked my wife, I said, can you send me some encouraging Bible verses? She emailed them to me. I printed them out and I took some scissors and I cut these different like Bible verses that were encouraging. I folded it and just put Jesus loves you on it. And, I, and so when the kids came up, and you're like, yeah, I can't wait. All right, it's a mission trip to my house, and they're coming. And they show up, and it was like a, it was like a, a Chinese fortune cookie, like, like meets Christianity, because there was a Bible verse that they got, but then they also got a piece of candy. And, and again, it wasn't, I wasn't preaching, be like, you flee from evil, you idiots. Like, I was just trying to steward it and encourage them. But what was, what was very interesting is through the night, there was, I, I saw a, a lady and her kids, and I just saw something in her eye like, that's different. And in my mind, I'm like, I wonder if down the road when that neighbor is working through something tough in their life, I wonder who they're, maybe they'll be like, who's the weirdo like Christian on Halloween that was giving out Bible verses? Maybe that dude has an answer for what I need. And I start thinking, man, like how, how can we maybe be in the world and not of it. I'm not compromising 
my faith, but I'm not stuck in a bubble. What does that look? It's such a tension, isn't it, Christian? I remember raising our kids, and I'm like, dude, I want them to be kids and have a good time, but I don't want them to partner with evil. What are we going to do? And for us, our conviction was like, they're going to never have an evil costume, but we're going to find ways to be able to engage in the culture and still have a good time. They used to go to the uh, retirement home on Halloween, dressed up in a non-evil costume, and they would go and just love on the folks that maybe haven't seen a family member for a year. It's, it's how, do we, how do we engage the world and pray for them, but, but not of it? It's personally. As a church, what really was cool is what happened these last couple of weeks. And we had a choice. Again, we can not participate at all, or we can go, you know what? Let's leverage in America when a bunch of people would maybe come to your campus that would never come before. And we said, you know what? We're just gonna send it. And we prayed about it. God invited us into it. And I'm telling you, and you saw it on the video, how many children showed up and they went, by the way, let's give it up for all the volunteers that serve. Thank you guys, by the way. I just love your heart. And, and they're creating interactive Bible stories for the kids to walk by and to learn the word of God and maybe they never would have their entire life. And what really hit me, church, is uh, the one in North Omaha. We were just having an amazing time. DJ Tay, the dude was rocking and I was vibe. It was great, just had a good time. And at the end of the night, I was finally having a hamburger and I sat at this table with a dude my age from North Omaha, with, had a bunch of kids around him. And this one little nine-year-old girl, she was the coolest chick. Like, like you know when the, like they have the gift of charisma? And, and I was like, man, my people, right there. And we just, we just bonded. We're having a good time. And she, she asked about the Orange Bible. There was one on the table. I said, man, thanks for asking. And I, and I showed her how you know, to read through it and then in the, in the summary statement. And she was all excited. And then one of her cousins was like, that's mine. I'm like, oh no. Well, that's cool because now you got one, but what about the other one? So, so I'm like, yo, we're gonna go through North Omaha and find an Orange Bible and get it. But I was thinking about this little girl, who knows if she ever gets into the Bible if it's not for us going, you know what? Let's be in the world, not of it. And so what does that look like? I'm, I promise you, if we can have this concept, something changes and we're, and we're thinking of how Jesus thinks. By the way, one of the things that really got religious people uptight around Jesus, you remember? Why are you always hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? Here's the thing. Some Christians that are over here, they're like, yeah, what about that? Well, I can tell you this. Jesus wasn't hanging out at the bar drinking and getting hammered and doing all the other stuff so he could fit in. Hello. Hello. But he also wasn't, do you know that the Jews, they would tighten up their robes and they'd walk by and be like, you better not touch me, sinners. That's why it was shocking when Jesus would go and be with them and break bread with them and, and, and like connect with them. The woman who was caught in adultery that we, just, that we just read recently, what did he do? Do you think he pulled up his robe like, oh? No, he looked at her and he's like, woman, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. That's a balance. That's in the world, not of it. And for what reason, and this is where we'll close, for them, that's number three. Look at verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Isn't it crazy? Like Jesus is talking to God the Father, and he's praying for you. If you're a believer, he was back then praying for you at that point. That blows my mind. Verse 21, that they all may be one, there it is, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Here it is, that the world may believe that you sent me. Do you see that? The oneness of the church, of the believers, the unity is actually gonna be the the testimony that will show the world that, that God sent Jesus into the world. And the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be just one, just as we are one. I in them, you in me, 
that they may be made perfect in one, and here it is again, that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you love me. Our unity as a church is a key ingredient to others believing. When the church divides, the non-believer looks at it and goes, why would I want that? I already have that. But when there's something different about the church that I can agree to disagree with you and your theological bent, and yet we can still embrace and love each other, now we got something cooking. I have a friend in our city who's a lead pastor, and he is literally the complete opposite of me. He speaks like real English. He's a brilliant guy, and he has very different theological stances that I do, but the beauty is we love each other. And there's so many leaders in our city that, that are doing this right now. We have a movement called Within Reach. Over 30 plus churches are saying, you know what? We're gonna put our differences aside and we're gonna unite under the banner of Jesus and we're gonna come together. And, and here's, here's what we say. We're no longer boxing each other out for bodies and bucks, but we're gonna lock arms to reach and disciple the lost and hurting in our city. And when you got that cooking, man, you, you got something. It, just this week, over 450 leaders from within reach met at City Light Church out west. And you know what our whole topic was? We brought in a guy uh, from Denver, and our whole challenge was to love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know your neighbor's name? So I'm going to give you the same thing that he gave. Do you know your neighbor's name? Do you pray for them? Pro tip, by the way, you know what I do? I take out notes on my phone, and when God opens up a door for me to meet someone, I, I, I pray for them, and I put their name, the date, and then a little description of how I met them. And then when you run into them again, you can pull out, because some of you guys are brainiacs, and you can remember like a million names, not me. I'd go to notes, I'd be like, yo, well, that's the homie that I almost got in a fight with at the gym, and then I asked him for forgiveness, and uh, what's his name again? Oh, yeah, so now I saw him at Best Buy, and I can go up to him and be like, yo, bro, so sorry. Again, I'm the weirdo pastor, but I misrepresented God. Can you forgive me? Remember that? We can do it. For them, oneness for them. We're not isolating, but we're not imitating. We're permeating, permeating a culture that's dying, is desperate, and they need Jesus. And you and I get to be on mission for him. It's him, his life living through us. I'll close with this story, and hopefully I don't butcher it, but it's a story I, I heard from one of my pastor friends, and he was telling a story about codfish and um, anybody eat cod? I, don't, I didn't, never even heard of it. Apparently, it's really good fish. It's firm. It's flaky. It's like real good stuff. And up in the Northwest, they catch a bunch of it. And they were, they were sending a bunch of this cod fish to the East Coast because the East Coast was like, yo, we got to get some of that cod, bro. And, and the problem was they would kill the fish. They'd freeze it. By the time it got to the East Coast, they'd start eating and be like, I don't know what you're talking about. This ain't real good. And so they're like, oh, we'll keep it alive. So instead of killing it and freezing it, they're like, we're just going to have a big tank and we'll put the cod in there, and the tanker would take it a couple days to the East Coast, and then, man, then we'd kill it, and then we'd eat it. And, this, and then a different thing happened. It was like, it was like flabby, and it was like, ugh. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. This cod all ain't that good, man. It's kind of flabby. It's kind of, ugh. And then a brilliant individual goes, I got an idea. What's the enemy of the cod? It's the catfish. I know what we'll do. We'll put the cod in the tank and the catfish in the tank. And then over the few days, instead of the cod just like laying back and being kind of lazy, that cod's like, oh, oh, I got the enemy in the tank. And now, by the time they got, the, the fish was still firm. And then they ate it. They're like, now I know what you're talking about. You're like, how does that relate to this? Hey, man. We got a lot of lazy, flimsy Christians floating around in the, in the bubble, not in the world, where the enemy is in the world. But man, if we can be in it, not of it, we can be firm, fish, solid Christians. And now when they taste you, they're like, that's something different. What is that? And you're like, man, that's Jesus in me, in the world. Amen. So again, man, we're not going to isolate. We're not going to imitate. We're going to permeate for the glory of God. Lord, thank you. Thanks for this word. 
So good, so good. And I just simply love reading through the Bible with my friends and considering truths that will set us free. And forgive us when maybe on one side we're, we've been isolating way too much. And God, we pray that you would uh, teach us. What does it look like? How do, we, how do we get out of the bubble but man, stay away from the evil one? How do we not burn bridges but build bridges? What does that look like? And so we need your spirit, we pray. Give us wisdom we'd walk in stride with your spirit. All of my Christian friends here, God, speak to us. We're open. We want to grow. We want to make adjustments as you see fit. We want to make a difference. I'm just thinking of even my friend here today. Earlier today at Panera, where you told me to go pray for that man. Thank you. Keep me uncomfortable. Keep me firm. Firm in the faith for your glory. In Jesus' name. Before I say 